Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Engineering Vice President for Google, Vic Gundotra. Well, good morning. On behalf of Google, let me extend a very warm welcome to all of you. It's just thrilling to see so many here for our first developer conference ever at the Moscone Center. Before I begin, I should just apologize. Uh, there's many of you who were stuck in very long registration lines. We decided to let many of those folks just come on up without registering. We do request that by 2 o'clock this afternoon, you please do find the time to get your badge. You'll need it later in the day. But we wanted to get as many people as possible into this room. We also made the decision not to shut down registration earlier last week. Um, and maybe that wasn't the best decision just for this room. I realize we're out of seats. For those of you that are standing in the back, there is a little bit of area on both sides of the front here where you can go sit down, which might be a little bit easier for this uh, opening keynote, which is about an hour and a half. Um, once again, thank you for your interest. It's uh, just really great to have all of you here. Now, before I begin, um, let me just uh, tell you a brief story. You know, when I joined Google, my family was, as you might expect, pretty excited. My dad called me up on the phone. He said, Vic, are you going to work on the search team? I said, no, no, Dad, I'm, I'm not going to work on the search team. He said, are you going to work on the ads team? I said, no, I, I'm not going to work on ads. He said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm, I'm going to work with the developer team. Developers? What does Google have to do with developers, he said. Well, answering that question, what Google is doing with developers, why we're doing it and why you should care, is really the whole point of the next uh, two days conference. At a very high level, Google cares about moving the web forward. The web has become the dominant platform of our era. And moving it forward, advancing it, is something that we think is critical to the entire ecosystem and something that Google, of course, is deeply interested in. Now, how is Google going to move the internet forward? How are we going to partner with the industry and advance this amazing platform that we all depend upon? Well, I'm going to talk about how we're going to do it and what are the three primary, primary areas of investment. But before I talk about those areas, I want to talk to you about some of the challenges developers have faced, that all of us have faced over the past 30 years. Some of the tensions that have reoccurred, we've oscillated on these tensions over the past 30 years, and we at Google believe that we are now at the cusp of solving some of these tensions and enabling new kinds of applications. So bear with me just for a few minutes, and let's think back as to the challenges we've faced in the past several decades. Think back to the era of the mainframe. You know, that era was marked by very powerful computing capability for its day. But that computing capability was not very accessible. People like you and me, we didn't have access to a mainframe. Unless you were lucky enough to work at a company that had a mainframe. And even then, you were given a thin time slice of that compute power. So there was power, but it wasn't very accessible. What about deploying software in that era? Well, deploying software was relatively easy. Once you got your job up on the mainframe, the deployment of that software to clients was easy. The clients were dumb terminals. Easy deployment, dumb terminals. The PC era came uh, about, and in many respects, we completely oscillated on these tensions. We gave up the massive computing power of the mainframe a little bit when we got the personal computer, but we gained accessibility. It was my personal computer. It was in my hands. It was in everyone's basements. And so we traded off power for accessibility. But what happened to the ease of deploying software? Any of you who've ever deployed software to thousands of machines, let alone millions of consumers, you know what happened. The PC era made it somewhat difficult. Am I going to break other applications when I install this application? Will I face DLL hell? How do I deal with the different ver uh, varieties of client operating systems? It became very expensive and challenging to deploy software. But what happened? We went from dumb terminals to powerful clients. The era of the internet came about, and in many respects, we went back to the same tensions again. The emergence of the Netscape browser ushered in the web as the client, I'm sorry, the browser as the client that mattered for the web. 
And that browser was great. It gave us the ease of deployment again. You want an app like Gmail or Salesforce? You just type in the URL and there comes your app. But what happened? We went back to the dumb terminal. In many respects, the browser limited us in what we were able to do and didn't give us the power of a native client. What about on the server side? We went from mainframe to PC to what today is massive compute clouds. The killer applications of today, whether it be Search or Amazon or eBay or Craigslist or a social app, these require massive computing capability. They require what we call clouds. Do you have a cloud? I suspect not. Clouds, in many respects, are just as inaccessible as mainframes were. At Google, we spend millions upon millions upon millions of dollars every 90 days, every quarter, investing in our data centers, as do other companies. And that is out of the reach of most developers. So is, is this where we are? Forever we're going to face these tensions? I get massive compute power, but it's inaccessible. I get ability to deploy software, but it's a dumb terminal. At Google, we believe we can solve these problems by making the cloud more accessible and by making the client more powerful. When we say client, we mean the browser. We call this an in-phase wave transformation. When instead of canceling each other out, we get amplification, we get something revolutionary. How is it that Google is going to make the cloud more accessible? How is it that we collectively can make the client, the browser, more powerful? We are going to hear those topics discussed at this conference. Now, some of you in the audience are looking at this and saying, well, uh, Vic, you missed something really important. Uh, between the cloud and the client, what about connectivity? And you're right. You know, certainly, if you're talking about an historical perspective over 30 years, you have to think about the revolution we've seen in connectivity. How many here remember coupling modems, 300 baud coupling modems? How about the Hayes 1200 baud modem, 2400 baud, 9600? I was going to go crazy when I got my 5600. I thought, you know, what, what could be faster than this? And today we think nothing of the fact that most of us, certainly many consumers in the US, have many megabytes of connectivity to their homes. Um, in other countries, the wireless phenomena goes well beyond even what we experience uh, in, in, the, in the wired world. I just got back from a trip from Japan. Would you believe in Japan, I picked up a phone, it was nothing unusual, it was available for sale there. Uh, the phone was getting 7.2 megabit per second broadband wirelessly. Isn't that amazing? So we've had this explosion, this revolution, we almost take it for granted. Connectivity has become pervasive, but us as developers, it has a big impact when you think about writing an application. You know, 10, 15 years ago when we wrote apps, we didn't necessarily think that connectivity would be pervasive, pervasive like it is today. Today we have to design for that, whether it be wired or wireless, and that presents some challenges. How do we keep connectivity pervasive, open, and usable for developers? We're going to talk about that. These three themes really represent the primary areas of investment for Google making the cloud more accessible, keeping connectivity pervasive and usable, and making the client, when we say client, we mean the client that matters in our era, the browser, more powerful. Now, before I get into how we're going to accomplish those objectives, let me step back and just explain or answer a question I often get. People say, well, Vic, you know, this is all good, but what's Google's motives? What are you, why are you guys doing this? We know why companies have developer conferences. They have developer conferences, they sell their runtimes, they drive their platform. You're telling me that Google believes the web is the platform, so what is Google doing with a developer conference? Well, let me explain. We have two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that Google was born in the era of the web. It's the only platform our company has ever known. The web was a platform that was formed by consensus. There was no company who gave you a sneak peek of the next generation of platform due in three years. It was all of us collectively who agreed to a few simple standards. And we created the internet. We agreed on CSS, XML, TCP, IP, HTTP, and so forth. And upon those simple standards emerged the platform that we now bet on. And so we come from a world of consensus and partnership. It's the only platform we've known and the only platform we know how to work, work on. And it's the platform that influences our very culture, a, a culture of consensus and partnership. 
I should point out, by the way, for any of you who talked to our founders, Larry and Sergey, they will tell you that we feel that we owe a debt of gratitude to the web and open source technologies. Larry and Sergey accomplished some amazing things in their dorm room at the creation of Google, yet they were standing upon the shoulders of open source work that enabled them to produce that magic. And so we feel a debt of gratitude to that community, and Google is committed to working with the open source community and giving back. Uh, there's, there's another reason. Another reason we invest in moving the web forward, and I'll put it as simply as I can. It benefits Google economically. As the web gets better, as the underpinnings, the technical capabilities of that web enable better web apps, those better web apps attract more users, for you and for us. For Google, more users means more Google searches and other forms of monetization that we have, which leads to more Google revenue. So we probably are among the, the company that's most incented economically to move the internet forward. And that money that we make, the revenue we make, we pour some of that money right back into the platform. And we spend hundreds of millions of dollars a, taking uh, our IP and giving it away. Efforts like Open Social, Android, Gears, the Google Web Toolkit, these are all open source projects. We have engineers, we pay for the IP, we pay for their salaries, we take that work and then we give it away as open source back to the web community to let this virtuous cycle you see here continue. And so those are our motivations. That's why Google is interested in moving the web platform forward. I should also point out that of all the audiences that we speak to at Google, you are probably the, excited, the audience that we're most excited about. You're like us, or we're like you, however you want to look at it. You know, a very large percentage of Google's employees are computer scientists. We're developers, we're programmers ourselves. And so to have a conference where we're able to talk to you about the challenges we faced in building Gmail, Calendar, Search, building the web apps that you are building as well is very exciting for us. We don't know if we've solved all the problems the right way, but we're happy to share with you what we're doing and through uh, our, fire, our fireside chats, our evening events, we're very eager to learn from you as well. We're here to listen to you, and collectively, through consensus, we can move that web platform forward. Let's now talk about exactly what we're doing. Let's talk about the client. We want to make that client more powerful. Today, if you think about how you build applications, you could argue that the richest applications are built to these native platforms. And yes, there's been some attempts to bridge the world to the internet and these native clients. But the reality is that the open web stack that we're referring to is the line in red, the web browser. And if you step back for a long enough time period, over 10 years, why well, you can see that web browser is evolving slowly. Certainly, the inclusion of XML HTTP requests in, late, in the late 1990s was a milestone for the browser. It allowed us to make those asynchronous calls. But do you remember the first application, widespread application, the, what, the one that was widely adopted that used XML HTTP requests? What kicked off the Ajax revolution? You remember? Yes, I heard a few here. There was a few apps. Someone yelled Outlook as an Ajax app. Another app that we're, we think helped contribute to demonstrating what was possible was Gmail in April of 2004. These and many apps really started to demonstrate, hey, in the web browser, you could in fact build an app that was surprising, that the web wasn't just about content. But why did it take that long before we used the dormant capabilities in the browser? Is that what we're stuck to? That we'll see innovation in the browser happen on time scales of decades? We think that's unacceptable. There have been recent improvements in the browser, things like the canvas tag in the latest generation of browsers that allow us to have higher fidelity. But at Google, we want to accelerate that red line. We want to move up the capabilities of that browser. We believe that that, in time, uh, will get richer and richer. One of our first steps to improve the platform was to introduce Gears last year. And for those of you who attended our conference last year, you'll no doubt remember that was one of the key highlights. We're very excited about Gears. Gears, at a, at a very simple level, is a plugin. It's a plugin that works in almost every browser. And that plugin extends the functionality of the browser. It does not change the programming model. It does not insert a new programming model. But it extends what you can do with JavaScript and the DOM 
by giving you offline capabilities, injecting a SQL database into those browsers, giving you ability to have asynchronous threads so that your calls no longer block. And we think that's a very exciting way to extend the browser. But what we're most excited about, you could say, in the last year, was not only the adoption of Gears, but how Gears affected the standards world. The HTML5 group has taken many of the key attributes of Gears, the offline capability, the storage, the SQL storage capability, and put that into HTML5. And at Google, we are thrilled. We are huge supporters of HTML5, and we believe that is the future direction of uh, where that client will go and are thrilled at the progress that that team is making in driving that browser forward. In some respects, you can think of Gears as a bleeding edge implementation where Google hardens its interfaces through real world applications at the same time with our deep support and our commitment for HTML5. I could talk to you on and on. Sometimes the best thing to do though is just stop and just show you what's capable with, H with, uh, with these new capabilities. To do that, I'd like to invite up my friend, Alan Herr. Alan is the Senior Vice President for Engineering at MySpace. Alan, come on up. And why don't I have Alan show you what MySpace is doing with Gears? Alan, welcome. Thank you, Vic. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Vic and thanking Google for our great partnership. We've been working on some great things, and today I'm going to be able to show you and talk a little bit about one of the things I'm most excited about. When we came to Google Developer Day 2007 with a few of our engineers last year, we walked away the most excited about the capabilities of Gears for us. If you think about it, MySpace was born on the web. MySpace's existence is on the web. So to have something that gives us even the potential ability to take advantage of the client is a huge net advantage for MySpace. So we went back to LA. We played around a little bit. We used a little bit of Ajax to fetch some mail headers and just persist them down to the client. And it, it was really exciting for us, and we showed it to product who wasn't really interested in what we did, but it gave them a whole bunch of new ideas that they could work on. And what we learned as we started to play with Gears is it's not just some offline cache ability. As Vic pointed out earlier, you have asynchronous threads. You're not going to block on the browser. Beyond that, you're, if you're doing some UI elements and you're doing full text indexing at the same time through Gears, you're not going to block on each other, which is super important to developers. It also gives you full text ability, and it gives you a, a SQL database on the local machine, which is really important to us to be able to persist and store data. So I'm going to take a minute and show you what MySpace has done with this in a live demo on the site. So if I come over here and I show you, hold on one sec. OK, so this is the typical MySpace mail messaging center as you see at pre-gears. And what you have is basically a 58 pages of messages, and let's say I'm looking for my buddy who just emailed me in the last few months, and I don't think I ever responded to him, but he asked if he could tour um, the database, I mean, the data center facilities at MySpace, and I know that he works for an ISP. So if I could, I'd probably search, but MySpace doesn't have the ability to do full text search. So normally I would have to just go over here, click the next button, and the next button, and scroll down, and the next button. And I know from doing this demo that I would have to get to the ninth page about five things down below the fold of the page to actually get to my buddy's email. But now, with the power of Gears, if I flip over to Firefox here, which is running Gears, the first thing you'll notice is below the Mail Center inbox text, there's now a search box. And you'll also notice you can turn search on and off. And under all of the headers, now an underline, which we all know on the web means you can sort now. So before, that didn't exist with Gears. So I know the word Tor, and I know the word ISP. So I'm probably usually going to type this, Tor ISP, and hit Enter. Well, the beauty of MySpace and full text search with Gears is when I start typing Tor, I haven't even gotten done. And this is in real time. And I hit Tor. And obviously, Tom's not the guy that wants to tour our data center. So I'm going to type ISP. And before I even get done, it's sorting this stuff in real time, it's not going back to the cloud. It is not going back to myspace.com. It is doing this using the power of your local desktop. So there I do, it's, there I am, I type tour ISP, and I see that I was able to get to my buddy who wants to tour the MySpace facilities. The other thing that's powerful that you can do with MySpace mail is you can do sorting now, and a lot of people, they'll skip through their email box, they'll read messages that they see that's very important to them, but then they'll have a lot of unread messages peppered throughout their inbox. And you can also go to the status bar, and you can hit sort on all your mail messages and get your unread messages to the top. Now, does this seem simple? Absolutely simple. Was it simple to develop? Absolutely simple to develop. The reality is it's the power underneath 
that's making it such a beautiful product. So when is this going to be available to the MySpace user base? It's going to be available right this second. So if you already have Gears installed on your machine because you're using Google Reader or one of the other things that Go Gears powers, you'll absolutely take advantage of it the minute you hit the MySpace Mail Messaging Center. Now what we've also done is if you have over 5,000 messages in your inbox, we put a hypertext link over top of your mailbox and ask you if you want to install Gears. And you absolutely don't have to, and if you ever want to stop using Gears for any reasons, it's easy to turn it off and get that data back off your machine. So thank you, Vic, and thank you, Google, and everyone here. Thank you very much, Al. <clears throat> of course, you know, we're very excited not just to see a premier application like MySpace extend the use of the browser in a very powerful way, but we're also very excited about the architectural impact. MySpace is offloading processing that used to have to happen in their, in their clouds now down to take advantage of the power at the edge of the network, those native uh, capabilities of the client. That's something very beautiful. That's watching that browser become more than a dumb terminal, really opening up and, and uh, getting more capability, which delights us. Let me talk about connectivity and keeping it pervasive and usable. You know, I talked about the wonderful explosion uh, that we've seen in the past 30 years of connectivity, but there is a little bit of a dark side for developers. You know, one of the other hats I wear at Google is I'm also responsible for many of our Google mobile applications, things like Google Search, uh, Google Maps, mobile maps. Maybe some of you use Google mobile maps. Uh, I see lots of heads nodding. Good. Uh, you know, it's fun to excite end users and deliver those applications, but I'll tell you, it's not fun to develop those things necessarily. We have to support so many platforms. When you talk about connectivity, you really mean how do I touch the end, uh, the, 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 the clients, which today really means mobile phones. Which mobile phones do I develop for? RIM, iPhone, Blackberry, Windows Mobile, Sony Ericsson, Java clients. It's crazy. Yeah, I'm not even beginning to touch on the 14 platforms that you have to go touch and build for if you really want to go build an app that spans all of those platforms. The marketplace is very, very fragmented. And not every developer, not every development team has the resources that Google does that they can invest and say, well, we'll build it for every platform. Well, some of you must be thinking, well, Vic, you're telling us to bet on the open web platform. Why don't you bet on the browser? And you'd be right. We believe in, over time, the browser on mobile devices will be the entry point for many, many applications. But today, the only browsers that are really capable of supporting applications on mobile devices are things like on the iPhone. And the vast majority of mobile phones do not have that capability of a WebKit-based browser. To solve these problems, Google has invested in a project known as Android. Android is an entirely open source, we believe, world-class mobile stack, all the way down from the lowest levels to the application level. And we hope that the mobile industry, and the early indications are is that we are correct in our assumption, will adopt this open source stack and really bring the best capabilities to consumers. The best capabilities include a world-class WebKit, uh, WebKit browser that comes along with Android. Let me invite up Steve Horowitz. Steve is around here somewhere. Steve is the engineering director responsible for the Android project. Uh, Steve, why don't you show the audience where we are with Android and give them a little bit more of an update. Sounds good, thank you, Vic. Okay, so um, as Vic mentioned, uh, you know, we've been working on Android for a little while uh, at, at Google, and uh, you know, there's just a couple key points I, I want to make about it before I kind of go into a demo. Uh, first, you know, as Vic mentioned, you know, it is a complete stack. It's not just uh, you know, an OS or a framework or a couple of applications. It is literally a complete stack. It's everything you need to build a mobile phone. Um, from the ground up. And, and it's something which, when we're done, we're going to give away to the industry very liberally, uh, open source you know, licensing that will be you know, very simple for anybody. And we're going to make this available to the industry to allow innovation on top of the platform and, and f to enable the, the industry at large to build and, and deploy devices with rich and powerful uh, features and functionality. Um, among those features, as Vic mentioned, is WebKit, right? WebKit at the core uh, is the browser that we're shipping with Android. Um, it will enable you to take advantage of all the great web connectivity and web APIs that you're learning about at this conference and that, that, are, that are available on an open web uh, platform. So WebKit browser 
built into Android, very easy to use. Um, all, your, all your web applications will run very well. Additionally, um, we are raising the bar on the client functionality uh, within the platform itself and the framework. Um, all frameworks that are available on mobile devices today have buttons and menus and, and you know, just basic functionality that, that you need to build applications, but you kind of have to do a lot of work to, to start to create interesting applications on these devices. Well, with Android, we're building in some key uh, interesting functionality, such as a WebKit view. It's actually a view that is all of the power of a web browser in a view that you can embed in your application and build on top of. You can build your own browser, add your own Chromes, do whatever you want to do to customize it. We also have a Maps view. Uh, the Maps view is, is just that. It's, it's Google Maps for mobile in a view. It's something which you can then take as a starting point for your application, and you can build on top of that, innovate on top of that, build friend finder applications, do whatever it is you want to do using the full power of Google Maps for mobile at the baseline. And these are just some of the things we're doing to, to enable some, some interesting uh, functionality and applications on Android. So what I'd like to, to do now is switch over to a demo of uh, a device here. So what you see here when I wake up the device is basically an unlock screen. This unlock screen is customizable. So you can basically choose, choose what your unlock pattern is. For example, if you want a simple gesture to unlock your phone, you could do that. I guess that's not the one I use this time. Or you can have a more secure pattern. So in this case, let's say I trace a G, and that'll unlock your device for you. So you can have a very friendly or complex, as secure as you like, uh, unlock gesture for your phone. Additionally, what we have here is the basic home screen uh, for Android. Um, there's a couple things on it, of course, basic stuff like uh, you know, applications that you can launch. It's also got a status bar at the top. The status bar has all the things you would expect. It's got the time, battery life, signal strength, uh, and so on. It also, also has some, some icons at the top, notifications that, that come from other applications. You know, of course, you see that in, in other phones as well, where you've got a mail or an SMS message that, or a calendar that the phone wants to make you aware of. Well, in most phones, you actually kind of have to guess and say, well, you know, where did that come from? What app launched or put that notification in? Well, with Android, you just touch on the status bar and drag it down, and you have access to the, um, all the notifications, and this is available to you from any application in the system. You don't have to be on the home screen to put on your status bar. Anywhere you are on the device, you click it, and then you can click on my calendar notification here. It'll tell me I have a test at 9 o'clock, and you can dismiss it that way. So you can easily get your missed calls, read email, et cetera, through the accessible status bar. We also have uh, a home screen here that I mentioned before. It shows you applications that you can launch, um, various apps I have on the device, uh, some favorites along the bottom. It also has a couple areas on it that you can move around to. So with a simple gesture of your hand, you can fling it around. You've got a Google search box, a clock. You want to move your clock around to customize it, simply drag it over. You can actually you know, customize things any way you like. You can also create shortcuts. Simply by pressing on an empty space here, it brings up a menu. Let's say I wanted to create a shortcut to my favorite browser bookmark. Let's say I want to you know, do the New York Times. And then it creates a New York Times icon here, which is very easy to access for your, for your web browser. You can also create shortcuts to other things. For example, uh, Gmail, uh, music playlist, contacts. For example, if I wanted to have a favorite contact on my, on my desktop here, just simply create it. And then I have simple one-tap access to the contact card for Adam. Uh, not his real number, so don't worry about uh, trying to call him there. Uh, so I showed you a little bit about the home screen. Again, uh, very simple app launcher. You notice that the, the uh, icons at the bottom are persistent, so you have your favorites along with all your customized content. We also talked early on about the WebKit and the web browser. So if I go ahead and launch the browser here, um, it's going to take us to the, uh, the Google homepage, which is basically something they call Grand Prix. It, it's, it's basically Google um, made for mobile devices. It gives you um, a Google search box, uh, access to your calendar, access to your Gmail, uh, et cetera. So basically, this app was written for you know, WebKit-enabled phones, didn't have to be modified to run on Android, Very, you know, just, just works out of the box. Um, so any, again, any work you do that uh, is, is taking advantage of WebKit-enabled phones will work uh, on, on Android without any modification. Another thing I want to show you on, uh, on Android is some of the uh, cool zooming technology. So here we have, uh, we'll go to the Google I.O. site here. Um, and you know, this is obviously the conference that you're at. You can see the website for it. Uh, you can do basic things like flinging the page around. You can also um, use some zoom stuff. For example, if you double tap, you get a little magnifier. By dragging that magnifier around, pick the part of the page you want to zoom in on, and we can go see Chris DeBona up close and personal there. Uh, you can you know, use this to navigate any site that you want to have access to and zoom in on a particular part of, of the page. Next, I'll show you uh, Google Maps. Again, uh, very important mobile application. Um, 
we have a 3G network that we're on here, and this device is 3G capable. So you know, you'll notice that you know, with 3G capable networks, you have very quick, easy access to all the Google Maps data. Uh, you can switch map modes here, for example. We can go to satellite view, and you can watch all the tiles load in at 3G speeds. And you can imagine what your apps are going to be able to do when they build themselves on top of GMM uh, with 3G networking behind them. You, they're going to be capable of some pretty impressive and powerful things. And then uh, another app that I want to show you really quick is, you know, you've uh, probably heard about our developer conference, or sorry, developer challenge, where we uh, sponsored an event to, to get all kinds of entries. We've had just huge interest in that. Uh, we've seen a lot of different entries. And actually, the thing I'm going to show you was not even an entry in the contest, but rather was done by our friends at, at Namco. Uh, you know, quick little diversion. Uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, classic games here, uh, Pac-Man. Go ahead and start up a new game. Got some time to kill, so uh, you, know, you guys have nothing else to do, right? So you can watch me play Pac-Man for a couple minutes. So here we go. Um, unfortunately, I, the sound isn't coming across real well here, but it's got all the favorite beeps, and it actually vibrates when you die. So it's, it reminds you that you got eaten by a monster. Uh, lastly, what I want to show you is some actually you know, newer technology, uh, something like uh, Street View here. Uh, you've probably seen Street View in the past. Um, you know, basically, the, uh, the technology that we have in here, which uses the Street View tiles that come in from the web. With a uh, flick of your finger, you can easily navigate around. But one of my favorite new features on Street View is the ability to use the built-in compass in this device. Switch on to compass mode. And then you can see that this device will actually track my movements. <laughs> so don't even have to lift a finger. So that's it. Just wanted to give you a taste of some of the cool new things that are coming for Android, and we can't wait to see the kind of applications that uh, you'll build for the platform. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. In addition to making connectivity more pervasive and usable through things like Android uh, and making the client more powerful, we also want to make the cloud more accessible. I talked to you earlier about the inaccessibility of some of these data centers. Uh, we really want to make that available for the average developer. It's important probably to just take a moment here and to acknowledge the contributions of Amazon. Amazon and their Amazon Web Services began to open up the Amazon infrastructure for developers, and I think they deserve a round of applause for taking a leadership position there. And, you know, at Google, we're interested in everything and everyone's efforts that moves that web platform forward. And so we, too, wanted to open up what we had as a wonderful asset, the Google data centers, and the underlying capabilities that we use when we build our Google applications. So about a month and a half ago, we introduced Google App Engine, uh, what we believe is a very simple way for developers to host their applications on top of the Google infrastructure. Today, we wanted to give you an update on how Google App Engine is going and also to highlight what's coming next. To do that, I'd like to invite up Kevin Gibbs. Kevin is the technical director, responsible technical lead for the project. Kevin, welcome. Why don't you show the audience where we are with Google App Engine? Right, thanks, Vic. So uh, since App Engine is a new product, I'd like to mention really quick what it is. App Engine is a system for exposing Google's scalable infrastructure to your server-side web applications. It's our effort to make the cloud more accessible by allowing you to run your apps within Google's cloud. Now, you might wonder, why do we think the cloud needs to be more accessible? Well, something that we noticed at Google is that it's currently pretty hard to create a web application. There are significant challenges you face and a number of tasks you have to accomplish to get even the simplest web app off the ground. Now, the first task, which is pretty obvious, you have to write the code for your app. But you were all expecting that. However, once you've got the code written, you've got to set up your Apache web server, set up your MySQL database, create your tables in the database, set up the configs between the web server and the database, set up the scripts to run your machine, find a way to push a new version of your code when you make changes, keep the machine running, all, all of that. And that's the technical challenge you face in setting up just the, the simplest web app that you want to try out. Now, once you've solved that technical challenge, You've got another challenge. You've got to find some place to actually run this app. And that means getting machines, either physical or virtual machines somewhere. 
That usually means one other thing. You've got to pay somebody to do that. And even for the smallest application that receives only a few requests a week, you usually have to pay someone to try it out and get it up and running. So now you've solved a technical challenge and you've solved a, a financial challenge. Your biggest challenge is still up ahead. You've got to maintain this website as it grows. Servers crash, hard disks fail, and the problem only gets worse as your app grows. As you start getting more traffic, you've got to reshard your database, you've got to get more machines, find a way to run your app on multiple machines, and so forth. All of that represents a lot of hassle for just creating a web application. That's what we wanted to make easier. And so I think that indicates what our uh, design goals were with App Engine. There are three. One, let's make it as easy as possible to create a web app. Let's make it easy to scale that app as the app gets bigger. And finally, let's make it free to get started so that anybody can create an app inside the cloud. Now, all of that was a little bit theoretical. Uh, I'd like to show you App Engine in action so you can see what it feels like to use App Engine. The first thing that you do when using App Engine is you develop locally. Using the text editor IDE that you're already familiar with, you write the code on your local machine, and our emulated APIs allow you to complete the, completely test the whole app and do all of your development on your machine. When you're ready and you've got an app working that you like, you deploy the app to Google. This is as simple as pressing a button or running a command line script. Your application is now deployed to our servers and is running there for you to use. After that, you're done, you've launched. Your app is now running and you can send the URL to anyone you want and start using it immediately. You can look at our consoles to see how your app's doing and check your logs and so forth. And the really exciting thing about this is that you thought ahead a little bit when you were running your app, you used our APIs carefully and you thought a little bit about scale, that app you just uploaded is ready to scale to millions of users with no further work needed by you. That's part of the promise of how we think we're making the cloud more accessible by making it more easy for you to take advantage of the cloud's power. So since our launch a month and a half ago, we've seen some interesting things built on App Engine. So maybe now I can answer the question, what can you build on App Engine? What can you do? Well, here are a couple examples. Uh, the first example is TweetWheel. This is an application that someone built which provides a graphic visualization of your friends on Twitter. It shows your networks between them and so forth. It runs completely on App Engine, fetching the data from Twitter, putting it together on the machine, and rendering it out to you. Another example of app that we've seen built on App Engine is Later Loop. Later Loop allows you to browse web pages on your machine and save them to your mobile device to view later on. Again, the whole thing is written and run on, runs on App Engine. Now, another reason why we built App Engine was because we wanted to use it ourselves here at Google. It's still hard even at Google to create a web app and get it out there really quickly for everyone to use. So one example of that, of how we've used App Engine ourselves, was after the tragic earthquake in the Sichuan province a couple weeks ago. A couple of Googlers noticed that the relief workers were having difficulty contributing the information from the field that they were finding. And so over the weekend, these engineers created an application that allowed them to con contribute their information and families to check and look for loved ones. I think it's an interesting example of how you can move very quickly with App Engine. Now, we've also been working with partners because we want to make sure that we're getting the whole view of what it takes to get an application working on App Engine and meeting your business needs. One of those partners is Pixverse, it's a widget maker. And here's what they had to say after playing with App Engine. We got a prototype of our new PixChat open social app running in App Engine and on the High Five Sandbox this morning. It took about three hours to get the app serving and our database code converted over. So we're excited to see more from them as time goes on. Now, I also want to point out that App Engine is just our first step towards making the cloud more accessible. There's a lot more that we want to do and a lot more that we want to make available. We want to make it possible for you to, do, to process large amounts of data within App Engine. We want to make it possible for you to work with rich media, videos and photos. We want to give you access to more infrastructure services so that you can do more in your application. 
In essence, we want to provide everything that rich, complex web apps need to scale in the cloud. Now, App Engine as it exists today is still in a preview release. We've got a lot of work left to do and a lot of challenges ahead of us. However, since our launch a month and a half ago, we've gotten really great feedback from the community. We've heard what you guys are interested in, what you want. We've had a lot of posts in our group and on blogs and so forth, and we've, we've really been taking that information in and we really appreciate it. In response to that feedback, I'm announcing today that we have created two new APIs for App Engine. They should be available sometime this week. Those APIs are the Memcache API and the Image API. The Memcache API allows you to use Memcache from within App Engine, the industry standard for distributed memory cache. It allows you to scale your applications much more quickly than you could before. We're also providing an image manipulation API in response to your request, which allows you to resize, crop, and otherwise alter images efficiently from within App Engine, which opens up more types of apps. Now, we've also heard resoundingly in your feedback that you'd like to know more about how much App Engine costs. You'd like to pay for it. In essence, you'd like to have billing for App Engine. So in response to that, today I'm announcing our expected pricing for App Engine. Now, we're still working on billing, and it's not complete yet. However, we hope to have billing done before the end of the year. When we do have billing done, this is what we expect to charge. Now, I want to emphasize that App Engine will always be free to get started. We expect that App Engine will allow you to serve around 5 million page views a month and about 500 megabytes of storage to get started. But if you go beyond 5 million page views, this is what you can expect to pay. Now, to give you an idea of that, for a typical application that's using, that's serving in another 5 million page views beyond the initial amount that we give you, it might cost around $40 a month, depending on the application. Now, the other announcement that I'd like to make, based on your feedback, is we've heard that you really want to try App Engine out. Since announcing it a month and a half ago, we've had over 150,000 people sign up to our wait list to try out App Engine. So in response to that, today I'm announcing that App Engine is now open for anyone to sign up and use immediately. <laughs> There's no longer any wait. You can log in immediately and start using it. So please, log in, create something, let us know what you think, give us that feedback, and let us know how you would like to make the cloud more accessible and easier to use. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Vic. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> very, very exciting work, and as Kevin mentioned, we're just getting started with that project, and uh, it's been thrilling to see the demand from you, and we're eager to hear what else we can do to make sure App Engine meets your needs. Now, for some of you, though, you already have an existing app. You've built an app. You're supporting customers today. How can Google make its cloud-based services useful to you? Obviously, Google has many applications from Calendar, Gmail, Search, YouTube, uh, RSS feeds, the list goes on and on and on. And our cloud supports those applications at tremendous scale. Wouldn't it be great if you could programmatically access that, uh, those applications to integrate with them? Or if you could sprinkle your site with a little bit of uh, code, a little bit of controls that would allow you to be able to bring in Google when you needed it? Well, that's exactly the efforts of our GData APIs and our Ajax APIs. And to show you what we're doing there, I'd like to invite up Mark Lukowski. Mark is the technical director for the Ajax APIs, and he's going to talk to you about GData as well as these controls. Welcome, Mark, and Thanks. why don't you show the audience? All right, thank you. So I'm going to be talking about uh, two classes of APIs today. We'll start with the Google Data APIs, the GData APIs, if you will. These APIs provide you with read-write access to, uh, to Google services, services like spreadsheets, like calendar, uh, like blogs, like Picasa, uh, and YouTube, health, notebook. The list goes on and on. This is access to the content, user-created content that you guys have put into Google Apps, and with the GData APIs, we give you read-write access to get that data you know, out of the Google Apps and maybe project it onto your website, like you might 
You might have a calendar that you've put, uh, you know, the, the concert schedule for your club, and you want to expose that same information onto your site. The G Data APIs let you, you know, do a query against your calendar, get back either XML or JavaScript, and then render that on your site. So you can project your, you know, Google App data any way you like uh, using these APIs. The next API I'm going to talk about is, is the AJAX APIs. These are very similar to the, to the uh, GData APIs, only they work against, you know, what I would call the, the open web. Google has put, you know, a lot of resources into, you know, crawling, categorizing, indexing the web. We do it on a, on a nonstop basis. And these APIs give you kind of a, a window into that, that processed web. You're able to access uh, business listings, news headlines, uh, RSS feeds, web search results, blog search results, anything you like. These are based on a, on a REST API, a read-only REST API that's very easy to use. And we uh, contrast that with the GData APIs that are based on the Atom Publishing Protocol that are read-write. So the APIs are very, very similar. They just target either the, the Google Apps or the public web. Now, this is kind of abstract, showing it in slide form, so I'm going to quick come over here and do a quick demo and show you these APIs in action. Hold on, let me log in here real quick, switch to my page. Okay. So I'm going to start with a typical website. Uh, it's a celebrity fan website, and, it, and my goal is to sprinkle some of that Google goodness onto this site to make it more interesting to my readers, uh, make it a little bit stickier. So the first thing I might want to do on a celebrity site is add some YouTube video. So I'm going to start by showing you the code that we have to put in here. So to get video on this page, searchable YouTube videos on this page, I need to do a couple things. I need to, number one, load the search API, and number two, load a, a video control API. So I do that up here with google.load. Then I uh, configure a set of options for the control. In this case, the only options that are really, really important are the YouTube queries that I want to that I want to use as the basis for my videos. In this case, since it's a celebrity fan site, I'm targeting the McDreamy McSteamy YouTube channel, which is a great collection of Grey's Anatomy videos, the Ingrid Michelson channel, which is a bunch of her videos, and then and then another random channel. So once I have those options set, I create a control. I uh, tell the control where on the page it's supposed to go, what kind of player it's supposed to use, and program it with those options. So then I drop this on the page, and sure enough, I've got a strip of videos on the right-hand side. And you guys have seen this kind of strip of videos uh, and, on a lot of different sites or static images. But here, you know, they, they do what you'd expect. You can play the videos. You can switch videos while one's playing. Uh, very easy to interact with this for your users. And it obviously keeps the site very sticky. But, but this is a very deep integration. It's not just, oh, I've got a strip of videos out in the corner that's a standalone island. I, these controls are so tightly integrated that you can actually embed hyperlinks in your code that change the queries. In this case, I did a query for American Idol videos. And sure enough, I can watch American Idol videos. If I'm into sports or news, I might type in a, a term like CBS and and see some videos from that, or search for NBA and, and watch some basketball clips, whatever you want to do. And this is all done, this, the site author deter, decides to hyperlink, whether to put a search box up there, whether it's just pre-populated queries, whatever. But you can see, even out of the gate, just by adding that strip of videos, I've really changed the look and feel and the interest level in, in my site. But what's missing is I, I need some, I, I want some RSS headlines. I want to pull in celebrity or entertainment news from other parts of the web. So what I'm going to do for that is include a media RSS feed. Same pattern as, as we've done for videos. We're just using a different kind of feed control, and the feed that we're targeting has a mix of, of media RSS elements as well as uh, text headlines and snippets and that sort of thing. So I start out, I load, uh, use google.load to load jQuery 1.2.6. I 
I load the feeds API, I load up our little slideshow super control, and then I specify the feed and create a media RSS control. And the result is I've got, I get a, an RSS control that shows headlines and some, and some photos. And you know, it does all the obvious things. I can hover over the, the titles and the image changes. If I leave it alone for a few seconds, the image will change on its own to the next story. That's great, media RSS feed. I might want to see that in text form. That might be more appropriate for my site. It's just as easy to do the text-based version of the, of the feed. So this is the same feed, only in text form. And you can see here I've chosen four headlines instead of three. These, those are all the simple options that you, the site designer, chooses. So this is great. I've got uh, a media RSS control. I've got YouTube videos. But what I'm missing is real hardcore news, entertainment news on my website. So let me go ahead and solve that problem, too. I put some code on the page. Here I'm loading the search API since news is a search uh, site. I create the, the news bar control down here, and I uh, populate that search control with some pre-canned queries. In this case, I just picked a generic, uh, simple people.com query. So I drop this code on here, and you can see I've got a horizontal strip of news on the site. Now, one thing to, to think about when you saw that, this news control is using the same kind of styling that, that you would see on the rest of the page. The hyperlinks are the same blue, the, the border color is the same border color. This is, the way that we get this effect is we use CSS, publicly documented CSS for every single one of these controls that you can go in and you can tweak the layout, tweak the color scheme, you know, suppress certain fields if they don't make sense for your site. You know, you have a lot of power when you're integrating these things deeply onto your site. And just like I showed you with the video bar, it's not a static strip of news. I can, you know, hyperlink portions of my page to change the news, so I'm going from celebrity news to U.S. political news, depending on, you know, what I want to do in my site. I can also put a search box up here and manually enter a search expression. And you saw, as soon as I hit enter over here, that changed the, the search expression, and away you go. You basically have all the power of Google News in, in these news controls. And they come in strip form, column form, box form, or write your own using our code as a, as a starting point, if you like. Next thing I'll do here, now that I have news, video, and feeds, is I need to put a celebrity map up here. It might be, you know, the last celebrity spotting. Who knows what? But it's the same basic idea. Load the search API, load the maps API, put a map on the site, and boom, I've got a map. But it's not a static map. It's actually a searchable map. I can search for the nearest, nearest Starbucks, and away you go. I got my map now has push pins for all the uh, Starbucks in the area. So it's, these things are incredibly easy to use. You've seen that already. Uh, I want to show you one more, one more API before we're gone. You see this post is written in French. I don't know how many of you in the, in the audience read French. But if you don't and you want to see it in English, we have the translation API that's just as easy to use as all these other APIs. You load the language. API, you find the text that you want to translate, you call the translate method. When the translation is, is complete, it calls your function, and your function takes the results of the translation, squirts it into uh, some DOM node, and away you go. So let me save that code into the site, and you can see the post got translated to English. Now, target language is obviously up to you as a developer. You can have a menu of alternate languages, and I can translate it into Russian, into German, into Dutch, whatever. It's, it's literally that easy. Obviously, the, the demo here, I'm not actually dropping that code in at the same time, but that is the code that's running, and it's, it's just as easy to develop that. So anyway, I want to end with a thank you for letting me show this to you, and good luck. Thanks, Vic. Thank you, Mark. Yep. We think that either through GData or the Ajax APIs, it really does provide you an ability to augment your existing application and leverage some of these great Google services if that makes sense for your application. 
Let's shift our focus now and talk about two other initiatives that we're driving at Google that really span all these areas, client connectivity and the cloud. What I'd like to talk to you about next is one of our efforts to make development easier. While we love the open web platform and we love the client, the browser, we do recognize that there are some challenges in building complex applications for the browser. For anybody here who's actually deployed and built a complex AJAX application, particularly if you have a large team of engineers, you do know the complexity of working with JavaScript. And you might think back to the days when you used a more strongly typed language, something like Java, and all the rich ecosystem you had with a great IDE, debugging support, and kind of long for those days. Well, if you're a Java developer, uh, we have a really great value proposition for you. Google Web Toolkit allows you to use a strongly typed language like Java to develop and have all the assets, including the IDE you're used to, but target AJAX on the client. Let me uh, actually invite up Bruce up on stage. Bruce Johnson is the engineering manager for the Google Web Toolkit. And Bruce, why don't you show everybody where we are with Google Web Toolkit, what's coming next in a demo. That sounds great. Thank you. So if you haven't already heard of it, Google Web Toolkit is an open source set of tools and libraries that gives you unusually strong leverage around the problem of creating very ambitious AJAX applications. And I'm not using the term ambitious lightly. I'm talking about highly interactive, comprehensive, high-functioning, high-performance applications. The sort of application that only a few years ago you would have expected to see only as a desktop application. The truth is that browsers are capable of providing those sorts of applications, but you need a lot of leverage in order to succeed in fulfilling your vision for that application. And if you spend all your time fighting browser quirks and fighting JavaScript, that's less time you're spending thinking about the uh, coolness that you're trying to actually achieve. So let's get right to what Google Web Toolkit really is all about. It is all about the idea that instead of coding directly in JavaScript, instead I can write in the Java programming language using my favorite Java tools. When I'm ready to um, uh, deploy into production, I simply cross-compile the Java source code into equivalent standalone JavaScript that I can deploy to any web browser from any web server. So in terms of the diagram here, on the left you see, hopefully, uh, one of the icons of your favorite IDE that you use every day. These are Java IDEs, including Eclipse, NetBeans, uh, IntelliJ, and so on. Those are tools that you already know and love, and that is how you continue to write code when you're using GWT. Now, that's not an exclusive set of de development tools, obviously. You can use any Java IDE that you want to. On the right, you see uh, the icon of a browser that you probably use every day, and this is the set of browsers that GWT can automatically support. Um, the browser market, in fact, as Vic mentioned earlier, is even becoming more fragmented these days when you add in mobile browsers as well. There's a whole uh, WebKit family of browsers for mobile uh, that the iPhone and Android support, and you can use GWT to easily and automatically target your application to those browsers as well. In the middle, you have the optimizing cross-compiler. It takes your Java source code in, it produces optimized JavaScript um, as a result. Now that's sort of the theoretical idea behind GWT, but I think it'll make more sense and you'll be more likely to believe me when I tell you how much more productive you can be with GWT if I show you an example. So first I need to explain one more thing. GWT is not just a cross compiler. As I said, it's a suite of tools and libraries. One of the most important other tools in GWT is what we call hosted mode. In hosted mode, you run your Java code as actual bytecode in the JVM while simultaneously driving a real browser so that you can interact and see the application, um, interact with and see the application as it really will be. So for this to really make sense, I think uh, a demo is in order. So let me switch over here to the computer. All right, oops. <laughs> um, this is uh, Eclipse, and it's, it, the, the point of this is actually that you've seen this before. 
This is probably a tool that many of you use every day, and you already, I don't have to tell you how cool it is, but because what qualifies as programming um, these days is writing JavaScript using Notepad or VI, I think it might actually be worth taking a step back and reminding you of the actual progress that we've made in modern development environments. So, um, uh, so let's, let's take a look at the fact that I get uh, the ability to easily uh, navigate my code using a UI. So for example, here are my various classes. There's this term object-oriented programming that a lot of people have found somewhat useful over the last uh, decade or so. Um, it's easy to visualize the structure of my code and I can apply good software engineering practices. I get a lot of help from my IDE as well, things like code completion, refactoring, um, searching for usages of particular identifiers and so on, all very powerful features which really ought not to be news to anyone, but being able to apply them to building AJAX applications is why this is exciting. So what I'm showing you here is um, the mail sample that is included with GWT. I launch this application as I would any Java application. And what you're seeing here is hosted mode. You're seeing uh, the real um, Safari web browser, and we have hooked in, magically, um, your Java bytecode so that you can use the application exactly as you would expect to, and all of its Ajaxy goodness. Right? This is a, a nice uh, functioning application, all written in Java. Now that is neat in and of itself, because I, again, I get all the Java productivity tools. But where it really, really makes a difference is when something goes wrong. And in the world of Ajax, things go wrong. So you, you tend to want to do things like debug, for example. I don't know if you've tried that yourself if you're writing JavaScript, but it is possible in Java, and we like to encourage people to actually debug the code before they ship it. So I've set a breakpoint in my IDE, and when I click on this hyperlink, I'm going to trigger the breakpoint. Ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> so it's kind of funny that it's noteworthy that I can set breakpoints and use my debugger, but it is, and the result is pretty huge. I get my stack trace, as I, I would expect to. I can set uh, line level breakpoints or exception breakpoints, data breakpoints, and so on. I can do things like easily single step through my source code. I can view my local variables, and we've even um, integrated the, the um, underlying DOM information back into the um, widget hierarchy so that you're able to do things like see the HTML that's associated with any particular widget easily right there in your debugger. I can con continue, and what I've done here is create a contact pop-up and shown it, and when I flip back to the browser, I can see that indeed the pop-up did show. Now, this is how you get a lot of leverage. I write one Java source code base that I can debug using my beloved Java tools, and I can build really sophisticated applications. To show you how this plays out in the real world, uh, I'm gonna show you an application built by uh, a company called Lombardi. Um, this is uh, Lombardi Blueprint, which is a diagramming tool. If I can remember my password. And as I show you this, I want you to imagine your normal expectations of a web application, superimpose that onto what I'm showing you here. This is not Flash, this is all Ajax, okay? What kinds of things would you expect to do in a diagramming tool? You would expect to uh, be able to edit things in place, right? Like, you know, I click on something that I want to edit and I edit it. Um, but this is diagramming, so I need to rearrange things a lot. I should be able to drag and drop things freely as I'm developing my ideas. I might want to be able to zoom in on certain subsections of the application. And then I might want to have a different view. For example, I want to be able to zoom out. All sorts of functionality, all are possible. This is Firefox too. All are possible in um, today's crop of browsers. You just have to have the right kind of leverage around the problem. And we're seeing um, increasingly that, that people are succeeding building very sophisticated applications when they have the leverage of Google Web Toolkit. Um, a great anecdote that made me really proud um, recently was um, one of the senior, en senior engineers on Google Help, and they used um, GWT to build Help. 
Um, and she said that uh, when she first started considering GWT, she was a, a JavaScript expert and was, was honestly um, a little bit skeptical of the value proposition. She tried it, fell in love with it, and now she said she would never consider writing any real application any other way. So we're pretty proud to get that kind of feedback from people. So now if we can switch back, I have some really exciting news to share. Um, as of today, the uh, Google Web Toolkit 1.5 release candidate is available for download on Google Code. And we finally knocked out our most requested feature for GWT, which is Java 5 language support. Um, it, it, uh, you take it for granted that this is the modern dialect of Java now, but if you think about the advancements in the Java language and that you can apply those directly to Ajax code, so I can write, I can use generics and autoboxing and enumerated types and annotations in the Java source code that I write and get the benefit of all that richness in, in terms of JavaScript that's automatically produced. In the process of cross-compiling, we have this great opportunity to really ratchet up the performance of the JavaScript that's produced. We can actually do things to your Java code by doing deep optimizations like inlining and uh, dead code removal and static evaluation and so on. So that the resulting JavaScript is extremely tight and fast. It's often the case that the, the JavaScript that you produce is faster than what anyone would write by hand because after all, if you're originally writing your code in JavaScript, it has to be maintainable in JavaScript. With GWT, you're writing it in Java, so it's maintainable. And you want to produce the fastest JavaScript possible. It doesn't matter if it's maintainable. So the compiler is able to go to um, pretty extreme lengths to make sure that your code is fast and tight and works really well for users. So uh, we're seeing that with uh, 1.5, people can download, um, recompile their application, and see anything from like a 20% performance improvement to a 2x performance improvement. And that is what I call leverage. Upgrade, recompile, and your application is noticeably faster to your end users. And that's the kind of value proposition that we have with GWT. Finally, as I mentioned, GWT is open source. And this is the right time to say a huge thank you to all of our open source contributors. We have something like 800 people who follow um, the trunk every single day and interact with us and, and provide dozens and dozens of patches, so many of which did make it into 1.5. Some of the most exciting and complex features came from third-party contributors. We support right-to-left languages, for example, in GWT 1.5, so that if you switch to Arabic, for example, your UI um, flips automatically. That was led by a third-party contributor uh, from the open source community. So many of the compiler optimizations that I mentioned are also contributed uh, from open source contributors, and we cannot thank you all enough for contributing. So the last question. After you grab GWT 1.5 today, and start building your next big thing is, what are you gonna do with all the time that you save? All the time you would have been plowing into fighting browser quirks? I have a suggestion. I hope you will come join us and work in the open source community to help make GWT even better as we build new versions. Thanks very much, I hope you try it out. Thank you, <clears throat> You know, if we were a marketing company instead of an engineering company, I might be tempted to go approach Justin Timberlake and license Sexy back, give it to Bruce's team, change the lyrics a little bit. He's bringing Java back. I don't know. I don't know. You got to take a risk. Sometimes it doesn't work. But uh, <laughs> I went there. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously with something like Google Web Toolkit, I should point out that we do take this very seriously. Uh, Google Web Toolkit is used by Google itself for some of our most important projects, our next generation of AdWords is built using Google Web Toolkit. Things like uh, our recently announced Google Health Initiative uses Google Web Toolkit, as well as many of our other um, efforts. And so really, we're sharing the very same tools we use to build our products with you. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing your contributions on GWT. Let me talk about another effort that spans all three of these areas, and that is uh, the open social effort. Google has been a participant in the open social community. Really, it's driven by what we see is consumers' desires to be more social, to communicate with each other. You kind of have to be blind not to notice what's happened over the past five years with the explosion of uh, applications like MySpace, Orkut, Facebook. People want to connect with people. 
And we at Google, with the broader community, wonder if we can move the web forward by enabling the web to be more social. Let me once again invite up one of the key members of our engineering team, David Glazer, who is the engineering director, who is responsible for Google's contributions to the open social effort. David, welcome, and why don't you walk us Thanks, through Rick. what we're doing here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. You know, when I looked at Vic's intro slides at the beginning where he was walking through some of the cycles, I saw waves, so I figured that it was probably time to do a little bit of a surf report. And the short version of the surf report on the social web is surf's up. Things are coming together beautifully. It's coming together not through any one company's efforts. Over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to walk you through what we see as some of the highlights of what's happening, why it's happening, and how it matters to all of you who are either people or web users. If you fit in either of those categories, we think this is important. So like most big waves, they usually happen, they usually crest when a few smaller waves come together. And keeping it very simple, there are two things that are coming together to make the social web. The first is, as Vic said a minute ago, social. People care about people. We've always cared about people. Killer apps, both before the web, of the web, email, are often, almost always, about helping people connect with people. That's always one of the things that we all care about most as humans. Second, equally obvious observation, is the web's a pretty good idea. So what is it about the web that's a good idea? It's the notion that by taking some simple standards that allow interoperability and connection of information, HTML, HTTP, the idea of URLs, put out some simple standards that are open, that everybody can use, that allow things to connect, and you get emergent properties. When you allow open standards to connect documents, you get the web. It's kind of working, kind of a good idea. Let's take these two ideas, two completely obvious ideas, Whenever the conditions allow them to come together, the goodness of the web with the power of the importance of social to us as people, that's what's driving the social web. Now, I wish that you know, we could say that this was someone at Google that came up with this idea originally. This is not a new idea. Tim Berners-Lee, a few, uh, few months ago, did a blog post on exactly this idea and just pointed out that the next wave, the wave that's coming now, is applying the same ideas that fueled the growth of the web bring that to the connection of people, take that same idea of simple, lightweight, interoperable connections between people, and we'll get the same kind of explosion in user value that the web did for data that we are now seeing happen in the social web. What's it take to do that? It's the web, it takes simple standards. It takes some agreed on ways to interoperate, to share information, to connect people to people. The three that I want to highlight here that are probably the three key ones that are the ones that over the last six months have shown the most progress have really been the enabling ones of this wave of social web experience. First one's around identity. Some way of saying, who am I? I go to a website, who am I? I don't necessarily want to create new credentials, new usernames every time I go somewhere new on the web. It would be nice to be able to share my identity across websites when I choose to. OpenID is a standard that's starting to get some nice adoption, get some nice traction for sites that choose to use it, either to be identity providers or relying parties to accept it. It lets me do exactly that, bring my identity with me wherever I want to go on the web. OK, so now we know who I am, but what can I do with that information? You need some answer to authorization. Authorization's kind of tricky because I have a lot of information about me, about things I care about, that I might store somewhere on the web. And yet, to get the power of a social web, I need to get at that information from somewhere else on the web. And how do I do that without providing too much access, where everyone can see everything, or too little access, where I have to enter it over and over again? So what you need is a standard for delegated authorization that lets a user securely say, I want to let this site get at this information for these purposes. And OAuth is a standard that, again, come together recently, and we're starting to see great adoption, both uh, inside and, and outside Google, of the OAuth standard and OAuth-like standards for authorization so I can get at my information from different places. And then finally, you know who I am. I have a way to control which of my information you can use for this and which you can use for that and where. I want to do something. I'm online. I, I, I've got, my, got the people I care about are online. I want to be able to interact with them. So you need a standard for building applications that let users actually do something with each other, building on the social information, the social graphs 
social data that they have provided. That's where open social comes in. Mixing metaphors a little bit, several of you were with us at a campfire about seven months ago where we pushed a snowball off the top of the cliff and started this tidal wave. So we've seen with open social, we've seen the community really start to take and run with it around building on the other open standards and open social to enable social applications to run anywhere on the web without users, without app developers having to build them over and over again. What is open social? Give you one slide each on the three key things. It's a set of APIs, an agreed upon standard set of APIs, specifications. It's a reference implementation, so people implementing those APIs can do it in a common way. And it's probably most importantly, the community, many of which are here, ma many more of which aren't here, of developers and implementers at all sides of the stack. So around the APIs, there are drill down sessions on some of these topics coming up later today and tomorrow. Around the APIs, the open social specification. Last night, we pushed uh, uh, version 0 0.8, which the community, for any of you who have been participating in the, the discussion group, have seen this coming for a while. Uh, it, it settled down last night on opensocial.org. You can see the 0 0.8 spec. There's a session on that tomorrow to talk more about what's in it. Another thing that is part of open social is in addition to just a specification, you want a reference implementation. Well, again, a member of the open social community back in November said, great idea to, ha to, to have this standard. How about if we get an Apache project going? That was an obviously good idea as soon as it was mentioned. So Apache Shindig is an open source project with committers from around the globe who have been building the reference implementation of open social, which means that as new APIs are available, they get baked into the reference and then all of the different adopters of open social who, who use that reference implementation can ride on that one, impl one shared implementation and roll it out more quickly. And then as I said, probably most importantly, it's the community of people, many of you here, many more of you not here. People, this community gets together online, there's lots of discussion groups. If you go to opensocial.org, you can find pointers to places to take part. And it also gets together in person. You saw some in the, uh, the video that rolled before, before the keynote started. You saw some shots of some of the meetups that had happened in, in India and in Asia. Um, I think these are mostly in the Bay Area and these particular pictures. Just getting people together to learn about, to work on, to hash out what the next steps should be in open social. So that's what open social is. To give you a sense of how this matters to application developers, how this matters to someone who's trying to get their application, social application, out to users across the web, I'd like to bring up Nat Brown, who's the CTO of iLike, one of the leading open social applications. And Nat's gonna give us a quick tour of how he uses open social. Thank you. <laughs> well, it, it wouldn't be a, a a developer event if there wasn't a ponytailed geek from Seattle like around for a while. Um, <laughs> so I, let, me, let me start by saying, wow, um, it's amazing to see so many people here. Um, I, I wish we had this many people you know, um, on our app all the time uh, sharing music with one another because that's what we do. And I like, we're a social music discovery um, application and our idea was a couple years ago we said, hey, People don't like algorithms telling them what to, what to play. They like their friends telling them what to do. And there's probably some social networks out there that, that do that. So we said, let's build our own social network. We're crazy. We can do it. Um, so what we did is we built a site called ilike.com. And over the course of about six months, we got three and a half million users. And we thought, wow, you know, we're, we're the crap. We, we really know how to do this stuff. Um, but what we realized was there's a whole lot more users. It's really hard to build your own social network. What we wanted to do was focus on music, so, um, and on recommending music to one another. So we figured there must be a wetter, better way to get these eyeballs, these fans, to, uh, to the music and to, to share it with one another. Um, and we realized that is the case. Um, we, we found that uh, social networks were really growing and we started to try to find platforms that we could build on and we, we found several of them. Um, I'm gonna show you one of them right now. I'm gonna try to show you one of them. If I can, I'm gonna show you some, some static content. Um, some static pictures of, of what we do. Um, let's not be me. Let's log out. Can we bring up the demo? Yeah, yeah, could you bring up the demo? Thanks. I'll, I'll see if I can sign in as me. I don't want you to remember that just yet. So, ilike.com was its own website, but we wanted to take 
everything that you could do, recommending songs, finding songs, sharing songs with your friends, making playlists, playable playlists, sharing playlists with people, um, taking a quiz that tests your music knowledge. We wanted to take that and we wanted to bring it to the social network. So here, here's how we put it onto High Five, um, a really cool social network, the first very early adopter of open social. And what happens on, on it is, um, is we get this box. This is the profile box. On, in open social you can have profile boxes that appear on people's profiles. You have home modules on some platforms. In fact, I think High Five's gonna add a home module. Uh, Orkut um, will someday get a home module. MySpace has a home module. Different types of modules where we can define what we wanna do in that circumstance, in that workflow that the app is using. So in this one, um, I can see the artists that, that, or I can show my friends the artists that I like. Um, uh, who, who's that? Elvis Costello. The, the Beatles, everyone likes the Beatles. But there's also some things I can do. I can play a song right in there. I don't think we have music wired up, but songs play right there. You, you don't want to hear my taste in music anyway. Uh, although Ockerville River is really quite good. Um, you can dedicate a song to a friend. That takes you into the canvas mode of the application. And it says, hey, wh what song do you want to dedicate? Um, of course, I want to, you know, I want to dedicate Fix You by Coldplay. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dedicate that to just all of my friends because everyone, everyone needs to hear this song and they need to, and, and they need to have a heart because I, I love them. Um, you, you gotta check out this song. And that's, you know, I'm giving you an example of something maybe sounds a little bit goofy, but all my friends are gonna get this message. If you've used Orkut, what happens he in here and actually in all open social apps is these, these users get notifications from, from me that say, hey, your friend has done something, come interact with this app. That gives us a chance as an application to, um, to, to interact with the user, to engage them, to get them to use our features, um, and to communicate with them about things like concerts that are coming up, or tickets that are on sale, or whatever else is going on. So this same application, um, with all of those capabilities, oh, here's, here's my dedication that I sent to some people. Um, I can also show you, if we can switch back to the slides, I can show you that we took that same application. So we took our same big application <laughs> and we, is it, did we shift to slides? Can we go back to the static slides? Oh, there we go, sorry. Um, so there we are on High Five, which I, show, which I showed you right now. Um, go to the next one. There we are on MySpace. There's a different, kind of a different view. We took our application and of course if you're a good app developer you don't just kind of jam the same thing into all these different places. You take it there and you say what's the best way to style this application? What's the best way to, uh, what's the best way to make it look? What's the best way to make it feel? Maybe it navigates differently. Maybe you use different verbs. Maybe you use different kind of upsells to different features you have. Here it is on Orkut. Uh, there's the challenge. Um, and the last thing that I want to show you is kind of one of the coolest new things that you'll, you'll probably hear from some, from some people here, um, which is very cool to us. And it's about syndicating applications, not just to these big social networks, which I told you, you know, as an app developer, it's great for me to be able to reach out and get all those places. But this is kind of the ultimate final place to get, which is the whole rest of the web. This is a picture of us syndicating Ingrid Michelson, who's a, who's a fantastic uh, artist. You should check out her music if you haven't. And what we did is we, we syndicated her songs, her fan wall, her concert calendar from our application into her website. And I've got millions of artists that I can syndicate content into and reach the whole web of users and syndicate out to them. And, you know, mine might be a very real example of music. That's some place you can imagine syndicating a lot of places. But it's up to you to think of a lot more applications that you can syndicate to a million places. This this is the realization for us of, of sort of a vision we had. When we started our first social network, our ilike.com, we said, this is great, how are we gonna get 100 million people to come to our website? And we finally realized we're not. We've gotta get our website to 100 million people. And this is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna syndicate our application and our content to all those sites. That's what we're gonna do. So thanks for having me here, you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Zach. So that's the value. One thing Nat didn't sit point out that's one of the attributes that goes along with being a ponytail, ponytail geek from Seattle is he's lazy. 
And laziness is a wonderful thing. You've seen a theme through many of our developer products. They, in, they cater to laziness, people who don't want to optimize themselves, people who don't want to write their own threading code, people who don't want to write their application over and over and over again every time they want to reach new users. So that's the promise of open social to app developers. How, is the, how have the numbers worked out? Seven months ago, this was our scorecard for open social. This was where we were seven months ago. This is roughly where we are now. These numbers are hard to pin down precisely, but our count says as if you build an open social application, you can now get it in front of 275 million users now. There are 20,000 developers who like that promise and are doing so, and there are 50 million users who have started to play with these applications. They have installed an open social app and on some container somewhere that they hang out on the web and said, hey, here's something new that I can do with the people I care about while I'm online. Where have they done that? These are the containers, the sites on the web, that today you can run an open social application. Many of these, like High Five and Orchid and MySpace that you just saw Nat show you, many of these are in full production release where, lots of, where, where all end users can use them. Others are in various stages of sandbox. Two brand new ones in the last 24 hours on here, NetLog in Europe and uh, Tinya in Asia. So open social is now reaching some other continents with, uh, with users able to do it. In addition to the containers that are live now, there's another set, that some of which you've seen before, uh, that have, are, have implementations in progress that are taking advantage of the momentum that's building with the reference implementation of Shindig, with the growing set of application developers, with the growing ecosystem, and said, yeah, we're doing this too. One that I'm very excited to announce that just, uh, in the, again, it just today has announced, AOL has announced that they're adding support for open social in their family of products. There's a meet the container session later today where I think AOL and, and, all, and several of these containers will be there so people can chat about that. This is where those numbers come from. It's from the folks who, who are represented on this slide implementing the APIs to allow developers to do it. I'm gonna do a quick teaser of the uh, spec drill down session tomorrow to talk about what's next for the open social API, what's happening in point eight and beyond. And I'm only gonna point out one thing. What we heard, the community heard on the various mailing groups when we had the meetups, what, a common theme that was coming up from app developers was, hey, we really like the programming model of open social in that it lets us take advantage of the power of the browser, in that it lets us use JavaScript native tools that we're used to for building web apps to build rich social applications. And there's some other kinds of programming that we'd also like to be able to use. Maybe we have a lot invested in a server side piece of our application. Maybe we like a markup style, more declarative style. We'd like to do that too. Those are two of the things that are coming, uh, coming in the open social spec. You'd be able to ha use a RESTful API to get at some server from servers, so the same information you can from the client. Be able to use a markup language to be able to describe uh, declaratively what you want your app to look like in, in addition to mixing and matching with the JavaScript and with the server side. The last point I want to hit is, as, as Nat mentioned, Google Friend Connect is building on the open standards that we talked about earlier, building on OpenID, building on OAuth, building on open social, the bringing the power of the social web to the rest of the web so that application builders who want to get their apps in front of more users can do so anywhere on the web. That's what Google Friend Connect does, building on all the great open standards work that we've been talking about that we as a, the larger we, the community, have been building. All of that is why I was able to say surfs up. The social web is doing great. We're excited by the momentum. We're excited by what's happening. We're most excited by the things that we're going to see over the next six months that, that we haven't seen yet. Thank you. Well, as my dad would ask, what does Google have to do with developers? I hope the last 90 minutes uh, gave you a little bit of an idea of some of our big initiatives. You got introduced to some of the key members of our engineering uh, team, and uh, this is just a taste of some of the 90 technical sessions we have at the conference. We are interested in making the cloud accessible, in making connectivity pervasive and usable, and making the client more powerful. The web is the dominant, preeminent platform of our time. It belongs to you, it belongs to me, it's our platform. Together we can move it forward. Google is deeply committed to that approach, to working through consensus with industry partners and by innovating in the open. 
Please enjoy the rest of the conference, and if you have any feedback, please feel free to send it to me. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, track sessions will begin shortly down one floor. Please take all your personal possessions and migrate down to the second level for the beginning of the track sessions. Thank you for joining us.